Today we'll be looking at the main things you need to know before purchasing a brand new motherboard. Let's start with board sizes, because there is a lot of them out there, and if you get the wrong board size, it's not going to fit in the case and potentially not have all the features you want on it. Now, there are loads of different sizes out there, especially in the past, but nowadays you're usually using one of five different types. The first one is going to be ITX, or some people call it Mini ITX. It's really a small board, ideal for small form factor computers, which need to take up a very small amount of room. The next size up is Micro ATX, that's slightly smaller than your standard size. You've got ATX, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Then you've got EATX, which means Extended ATX, which basically means it's got a little bit extra on the side. And then you've got XL ATX, which is rare, but is around. And as you can imagine, XL means it's extra large. To the CPU socket. So that's this thing here. This is where your processor fits in. Now, if you've got an Intel socket, you can't fit an AMD processor and vice versa. And saying that, even if you've got an Intel-based board socket, if you've got the wrong type of chip, it will not fit. So you need to make sure the motherboard you've got supports the CPU you're planning to put on it. In general, the general rule is, is if your processor says it is a socket 1700 CPU, then it'll fit a board which is socket 1700. But in some cases, if the processor's a lot newer than the motherboard, you may have to update what's called the BIOS inside the board before you can do it, which can be difficult to do if you don't have the older processor to do it. But otherwise, there are lots of types of sockets. You want to watch out for these pins because if you do break any of the pins or bend them, it can be very difficult to put them back in place because of that small. On AMD processors, it's slightly different and boards. The, rather than having the pins on the actual socket, the pins are on the bottom of the processor. So if you break a pin on the bottom of the processor, you could potentially have killed your processor and then it's not going to work. But bear in mind, newer AMD processors which are coming out should be coming with a similar format as this where the pins are on the board. And again, if you damage that, it's a total write-up. Okay, down to RAM or memory, depending on what you want to call it. Reason is a lot of people call it memory rather than RAM is because RAM stands for random access memory. Hence, they just say memory because it's easier to remember. But the basics is on most boards, you have four or two slots. So the way you load it depends on what it says in the manual. But in most cases, you would load either this slot first or this slot, depending on what it is. If you've only got one stick of memory, really doesn't matter too much but if you're using what's called dual channel memory that's where you use two identical sticks at the same time you'll want to leave a gap between the two so when you put it in this slot you'll need to put it in the second one in this slot here so you've left a gap between the two if you're using four sticks of memory then you can fill all four, there shouldn't be an issue. But again, you need to make sure when you're doing dual channel memory, which I do advise you use two sticks rather than one, you do get the advantage of better performance, not because there's more memory, it's the way the actual memory work time, which means they can work potentially faster, especially when playing games or doing creative work. Now, regarding RAM types, there are quite a few, but the basics is if your motherboard says it supports DDR5 memory, you buy DDR5 memory. It says four, you buy four and so forth. Pretty straightforward. There are different speeds out there. Best thing to do is check to see what your processor's optimal speed for RAM is. It's usually on the information on the website for the manufacturer. And let's say they say the optimal speed for the memory is 3200 megahertz. Then you buy RAM, what runs at that speed. There are other ratings as well, but we'll go into that on another video at another time. Now down to what's called PCI Express slots. These are basically what they're called expansion slots. So you can add in things like graphics cards, potentially sound cards if you really wanted to, and wireless cards maybe as well. There's usually a few different sizes in these slots. For example, this board's got a really long one there, as well as a long one there. They're pretty much the same both of those. And then you've got a small one there as well. Now, graphics cards will generally go into the top long slot. And 
Depending on the graphics card, it might say you need a slot what runs at 16 speed or 32 speed or whatever it may be. Make sure that the slot on the board is the same speed, otherwise it could potentially have a bottleneck where it can't run as fast because the socket won't allow it. But otherwise, that's pretty much what the sockets are for. There are older types out there called PCI and ISO, but generally you're not gonna see those around these days because they're pretty much obsolete unless you've got something really wonderful and weird. Now, one thing to bear in mind is depending on the processor you've got on your board, you may need a graphics card. So for example, if you were to get in most Intel processors, if it's got an F, on the end so that's the letter f for foxtrot that means it doesn't have a built-in graphics card so that means you have to go out and buy a graphics card and slot it in there generally though you will find graphics cards which you are slotted in run a lot lot faster than the graphics cards which are built into the processors so you may want to go out and buy one anyway because if you want to play games the ones what with built-in graphics are not usually that good to be honest they're okay for doing standard multimedia stuff watching videos and stuff like that but for playing games, they can struggle. Let's move on to storage. So this is like what you would call traditionally a hard drive or a solid state drive in your computer. Now there's really two type of connections for this. Well, sort of three in one, in one sense, but really they look very similar. Now the first one is a SATA connection. This is traditionally used for your old hard drives or earlier version of solid state drives. These connections look like this here. So it's an L-shaped connector. Now, saying that, you can still use these. Most boards have connections for at least a couple on there. For example, this one has six. Sometimes they look like they're hanging off the edge of the board, like this way, or they could be sitting upright, so you plug in straight down onto them. Those are what's called SATA connections or serial ATA connections. These days, you're getting used less and less, unless you're wanting a large hard drive or a lot of external storage, what's not gonna be screwed directly into your board. Now going on to screwing directly into your board, most motherboards these days support M.2 based solid state drives. Now M.2 slots, there's two types. There's the SATA type, so similar to the name of that, and it runs at similar speeds as that's capable of. And they're generally the sort of the older generation of the connector. Then they updated them and called them NVMe type drives, and they can run a lot, lot, lot faster. For example, a traditional hard drive connected to one of these runs at about 100 to 150 megabytes per second. Solid state drive can run up to 550. Now, if you've got an M.2, the SATA type runs similar sort of speeds as the SSD you would plug into there. Now, the NVMe type drives, the traditional versions, can go usually anywhere from one and a half thousand megabytes per second up to potentially 7,000 or more megabytes per second. Now, some motherboards will tell you, or say, yes, this supports generation three, generation four, or generation five solid state drives. Now, bear in mind, you need to check what which ones you're using, because if you've got an SSD, an NVMe-based SSD, which is a generation four, you need to have a board what has got a generation four socket on it, Otherwise, it's not going to run at full speed. It will still work, but at a slower speed. Now, these sockets are usually in different places on the board, sometimes even on the back of the board on some unique boards. But a lot of times, it's basically a long socket. It looks a bit like a memory stick. You slot it in, and then you screw it in. And it's usually one around where you'd plug in your graphics card, usually. But for example, this board has actually got four sockets, so you can put one here one here one here and one here and in some cases you will have a piece of metal what goes over the top what you call a heat sink which helps draw heat away from it to keep it cool and allow it to run faster okay let's get down to power connections obviously you need to power this so you need to plug in your power supply what comes inside your case or you may have to purchase it separately and plug it into the board and you need to make sure your power supply is a high enough wattage to run all your components but that's a story for another day but the connections are on here this is the class as the 24 pin motherboard connection that powers generally most of the things on the board so pretty much everything you see 
there is powered through this. Older motherboards may only use a 20 pin connection instead of 24. That's why if you look at your power supply cable, the 24 or the 20 plus four or however they put it on their box, it's usually got four pins which you can pull sideways to separate it. But generally you want those all together and fill all those with the connector. Now there are another one or two connectors usually on the top of the boards these days, which are here. They can be either a single four pin connector, a single eight pin, or potentially even an eight pin and a four pin, or two eight pins or two four pin connections. But you'll have those generally on your power supply connection. These are here to power the processor. Some processors use a lot of power and a high wattage, and so they'll generally need both of these plugging in. If you've got a low wattage processor, you could potentially get away with just plugging one cable in and leaving the other one blank. But generally, I would advise using both to make sure it's 100% stable. Now on a rare occasions you will get boards, especially the larger boards which may have another connection used sometimes around the edge or near the bottom usually where you can plug in what's called a Molex connection or a SATA connection like you would on a traditional hard drive into the board to give it a little bit more juice because the components or whatever's built into the board just requires that a little bit more power to get it going. Now let's get down to USB connections. There is actually three types of connections to look out for. So you've got traditional USB 2 connections. That's what you tend to get on a lot of the machines, especially older machines may just have those and not other options. But the headers for those are here and here on this board. Bear in mind, every board is different and it could be moved around. But the basics is it's a line of five pins with a line of four pins underneath. It looks like there's one pin missing out. And basically you plug your header in there and then it allows the USB connectors on the front of your case to work. Now, if you've got USB type three or some variation of it, you'll have another connection like this. Again, this could be anywhere on the board from here. It could be at the bottom and so forth, but that's got lots of smaller pin connections on it. And that's where you would plug that into. And the third type is USB type type C, which is this connection here, or for USB 3.1 or 3.2 or whatever, you generally use that header there. So it's a slightly different to the others. So it's not a pin type connection. It's more of a male connection where you have to stick it into the slot. But saying that, it does exactly the same job. USB is USB, but obviously the connections are slightly different depending on if you've got type A or type C. On your motherboard, you'll probably have quite a few different fan connections or headers where you can plug fans into, for example, the fan from your processor heatsink or the ones on the front or the back of your case and even water coolers and so forth. Now, they're all basically the same these days. They usually got four pin connections. You may get ones what have got a three pin connection around still. But if you've got a fan cable, which has only got three pins on it, you can plug that into a four pin header. It will still work. Now the one what goes to your processor again every board is different but for example on this board if you had got a let's just say a standard Intel heatsink there will be a connection at the top of the board just there where you plug that into to power the fan. Not only does it power the fan it also allows the fan to change speed depending on the actual temperature of the component what's being monitored now if you were connecting a water cooler on this you would connect up the main water cooler to that connection and there's another connection called optional cpu optional which you would connect up the fans from the radiator or other bits now there can be these types of connections all over the boards but generally if you're doing a water cooler or CPU call that you would connect them generally in the top part of the board. Now on this board, you have also got connections down the bottom, down here, so there's two there. There's also one just down here as well. And another two up here. So you could connect up as many, well, not as many, but a lot of different fans if you wanted to. But in a lot of cases these days, you have usually a controller on the back of the case where most of the fans plug into anyway. And then you just have one lead which will plug into one of those connections on the board. It doesn't really matter which one you plug them in, with the exception of the ones at the top. They all do basically the same thing. Next is the audio header, which is this connection here. It's basically two rows of pins, five on one row, 
and four on the other row. It looks like there's one missing nearly in the middle. That's to connect up your front panel audio on your case so you can plug things in like headphones and microphones into the audio jacks. Okay, so now we're going to look at RGB connections. This is where you'd plug in basically cables to your board which attach to some lights or some fans which have got some fancy lights where they change colours between red, blue, green or whatever. Now, there are different types of connections and there's quite a few of them out there. There are two main ones you'll get on most boards these days, but some manufacturers decide to design their own special ones which can get a little bit complicated complicated but I'm just going to run you through the main two so you've got what's called a 12 volt 4 pin connection and on this board they're right up here so they've got a little white background but they may not on your board it could be black but it's basically four pins next to each other and that basically allows the fans to change colour or the lights, but it means that the colour of all of the things connected to that connector have to be one colour at a time. So, for example, the fan can only be red or can be blue. It can change from red to blue, but it has to be the whole thing at any one time has to be the same colour. Now, you've got the 5 volt connections, and again, you need to make sure that the device you're plugging in obviously is a 5 volt version which takes a 3 pin connection which on this board is at the bottom down here. When I say 3 pin connection it actually looks like it's 4 pin because it's 2 pins miss one and then a pin so it looks like there's one pin fallen out so it looks very similar to the other ones and can get be easy to get mixed up and if you plug the wrong ones into the wrong ones you could potentially blow not only just the board, but the actual lights and colours and so it doesn't light up and so forth. So this is the 5 volt, that's the newer type, which allows the lighting of your fans and lights and so forth to be different colours at the same time. For example, the fan could be red on one half and blue on the other half, or it could be complete rainbow effect spinning around different colours and so forth, where the other standard RGB header, the 12 volt one, only allows the fan to be one colour at a time. Now at the bottom right hand corner of your motherboard there'll be what's called a front panel connector or headers or whatever they want to call them but it's generally front panel something down the bottom right hand corner it can be sometimes a little bit higher up or even more vertical or horizontal but the basics is it's there. I would suggest you check with your motherboard manual about which things connect to which pins. It's generally the same things in the same order. For example, the pin three and four is usually for the power cable, and then the two below it is for the reset button, and then the other ones are generally for your power LED light and hard drive LED light or solid state drive if you're using one instead. But the basics is those cables go to your front panel and allow you to use your buttons and stuff. If you get those connected up wrong, you just won't be able to switch your machine on. You will also notice on the motherboard there is usually a battery. Sometimes it's covered up or if it's a laptop it may look a little bit different but it looks a bit like a watch battery or a battery you'd put in some type of remote control. This is what's called the CMOS battery. It's called the 2032 battery to be precise and that's basically what keeps all the information saved on your board when there's no obviously power to it. So for example things like the settings like if you've overclocked it, the time time and the date and stuff like that. That keeps all that information on the board so it doesn't forget. And if you ever start your computer up and find that the time and date is wrong every single time after the power's gone off, that's because this battery is more than likely gone and it needs replacing and it's usually pretty easy. It's a little flicky switch there, he says. Try it again. There you go and it pops out. You get a new one and push it in. Obviously, make sure the machine is powered off, not plugged in, and so forth when you're doing so. Okay, now we're going to have a look at the I.O. panel. I.O. stands for input-output, which basically means that information goes in and out, and you can also plug things in and out of it as well. Now, this is the bit you'll see on the back of the case, near where your power cable goes in and stuff like that. You will have some connections possibly on the board, like HDMI, DP, which is display port, VGA and DVI, which are all different ways of plugging in monitors or TVs into your computer. But bear in mind, it does not necessarily mean they'll work because if you've got a dedicated graphics card put in the PCI slot, like we mentioned earlier on, you will find 
find it will disable those in most cases, so you can't use them anyway. You would plug in your cable to your monitor or TV directly into the graphics card over here. Also, if you've got, as we said before, a processor, which, for example, if it's an Intel processor, which in the model number has the letter F for Foxtrot, it means it's got no graphics built in, which means that those will not work because there's no graphics built into the processor. And again, you will need to put a graphics card in and plug into there. You also have multiple USB connections on there. If it's usually a blue connection on the actual USB header, that means that it's gonna be USB free or three point something, which means it's a high speed one. If it's black, it generally means it's an older type of USB. And if it's smaller, it's generally USB type C like this one here. And if if it's red or something else it could be either a faster version or a fast charge version so you could plug in devices so it charges up faster even when the pc is off it will be on board and manufacturer though you'll also have a lan connection or ethernet connection there that's where you plug into your network if you're cabling directly into a router or a switch this board has got wireless built into it, so it's got two wireless headers where you would screw in basically an antenna into both of those, so you can get a wireless signal and connect up to the internet. Otherwise, you can buy wireless dongles, which you plug into the USB, or you can actually add one into one of the PCI slots, depending on the type you buy. And then you've got your audio connection. This board has got six connections, a lot only have three. But depending on the connections you can have, you can have standard stereo audio. You could potentially have 5.1 surround sound audio, depending on the connections. Again, check your manual, depending on your board. And a lot also have a digital connection there. So you could potentially hook it up to an amplifier or something along that lines. Otherwise, that's pretty much it for all the connections on the board. Did you enjoy this video? Well, why not click this box just over here about how to apply thermal paste to your processor and what difference it makes when you apply it slightly different. Otherwise, give us a thumbs up, like, subscribe. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.